All right, well, so I know, um, starting off today, uh, I know we're going to have a heat wave this week, and um, that, uh, you know, high, high 90s, maybe even break 100s kind of a heat is not something we're maybe used to in the Pacific Northwest, and so just in case you don't have air conditioning in your home or your car or other places, I did some digging for you to try to find... I just want to be really practically helpful today. If you don't hear anything else or nothing else is helpful, maybe this will just be helpful. Some practical, helpful ways for you to stay cool this week. I've, done the be- I've looked through the best of the internet to help you find ways to stay cool this week. Um, guys especially, this may catch your attention. So just in case your car does not have AC, I've got a solution for you here. <laughs> Somebody you know owns a generator, all right? Um, All right, no AC in your home? No problem. Here's a solution that ought to work for you. If not, oh no, is that beer in the fridge? I just realized I put a picture. Oh, whoops, I didn't think through that one very well. We better go on to the next one real quick. Another option, there we go. Uh, Another option for staying cool in your home, a little, if you don't have any AC, maybe this one would help too. And last but not least, um, no swimming pool because the stores are out of stock, no problem. Get going on it, here you go, and I'll wait for you to stay cool. So this week, the heat is coming, do what you can, stay cool, you don't want to overheat. So appropriate to share these on Father's Day because you know that every one of these was some guy who was like, hmm... I've got an idea, right? And their wife or kids were like, oh, no, what's he going to do now? You know, and he's hanging out in the tarp swimming pool in the backyard because nobody else would join him. All right, yes, it's Father's Day. We're going to talk to fathers and dads today. Yes, we're going to talk about being men of truth. So I thought about it today. I thought maybe we'll go about this a little bit different way, though. Um, so a few, a few weeks ago, we talked about the concept of shame, And I was not prepared for the huge response of folks who caught me afterwards and said, hey, man, that really connected with my heart because I, too, battle these messages of shame. Here's what we said is the deal, the, the difference between shame and guilt, right? Guilt is about something that you have done and you know you shouldn't have done it. It was a bad decision, bad choice that you made and you say, I feel guilty or for what I've, what I've done. And sometimes we struggle to accept and, 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 uh, own up to the bad things we've done, and to acknowledge the guilt that we we should be feeling. Shame is different. Shame is not about what we've done. It's a message of who we are. It's that message that usually, and it's a negative response. It's It's something we believe about ourselves that says, I am, I am bad, I am weak, I am unlovable. And, And you see the difference between what you've done versus who you are. And unfortunately, here's what we do we start to begin to believe the lies of shame. You see, see, shame is always going to be a lie. It's not the truth. And because we buy into the lie of shame, I believe that that makes the, believing the lies of shame almost makes it impossible for us to believe the truth of guilt. Because shame pushes us down so far that we don't even have the strength to acknowledge where we have been guilty and we get it backwards. Maybe, maybe if we could deal with the shame issue and reject the lies of shame, maybe then we could own up to where we've made mistakes and screwed up and feel the guilt that maybe we should be feeling. I was not prepared for the response of folks to come and talk to me to say, hey, that's me too. Because I do believe, and especially, now I'm, not, I'm not saying that women don't struggle with shame. They do. The, the, I, I think the core messages are a little bit different, but especially for guys. You struggle with those voices of shame. We're going to talk about that today. Revisit it a little bit because I believe it's, it's, it's kind of under the surface in the next story that we find in the Gospel of John as we've been walking through John, listening to how Jesus is talking about truth. So here we are, John chapter 13, and uh, we're going to look at a couple of different stories today, but it begins with this one here right at the start of the passage, John 13, and uh, let me just start reading at verse 1. It was just before the Passover festival. Jesus knew that his hour had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the very end. And in other words, this is a transition point. They're celebrating the Last Supper here, the Passover meal. After this, Jesus will go. They will go to the garden. He will pray all night. He will be arrested, tried, crucified, dead, buried, resurrected, later ascended into heaven. And so this, the, 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 there's a definite transition point. His hour come to leave. 
Having loved his own who were in the world, now he loved them to the end. How does he show love right now? How does he love them? And he's going to show them some love right now in this story here. Let me just read it all the way through. Maybe sometimes, as you hear this story, maybe it'd be better for you if you're more of kind of an auditory learner or an imaginatory, imaginary learner. Maybe rather than just reading the words on the screen, maybe you just close your eyes and let this scene unfold in your mind and see it, feel it, put yourself there in the room watching this happen. Here we go. The evening meal was in progress. The devil had already prompted Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, to betray Jesus. And Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power and that he had come from God and he was returning to God. So he got up from the meal, he took off his outer clothing, and he wrapped a towel around his waist. After that, he poured the water into a basin and he began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with a towel that was wrapped around him. Can you see it? Imagine it. A little bit of awkward tension in the room. They hadn't taken care to hire a servant to do the foot washing. So Jesus, the creator of all, down on his knees, washing their feet. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus replied, you do not realize now what I am doing, but later you will understand. No, said Peter, you shall never wash my feet. This is wrong. This is not how it's supposed to be. If you're Messiah, if you're king, if you're the son of God, if you're the creator of the world, no, 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 you are not supposed to wash my feet. It's actually supposed to be the other way around, but I don't know how to turn it around. No, I'm not going to let you wash my feet. Jesus answered, unless I wash you, you have no part with me. Then, Lord, Simon Peter replied, not just my feet, my hands, my head as well. Jesus replied, Jesus answered, those who have had a bath only need to wash their feet. Their whole body is clean. And you are clean, though not every one of you. For he knew who was going to betray him, and that's why he said not everyone was clean. And when he had finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes, and he returned to his place at the table. Do you understand what I have done for you? He asked them. So they think about it and they're like, hmm, what have you done for us? And I imagine they're like, okay, this is one of those parable moments. And Jesus tells these parables, or now he shows us a parable, and there's a deeper meaning, a hidden meaning, and it has something to do with washing, and there's like sins, and when you sin and you mess up, you do something you shouldn't do, and like washing is kind of like cleansing, and so, and Peter kind of got that, that was, that was his, what he was thinking, like, don't just wash my feet, I want you to wash my whole body so that I could be clean, because I've made a lot of bad decisions and a lot of bad choices, and, and you're the son of God, and God wants to make us clean and pure and holy, and there's a lot of Old Testament symbolism that comes with that, and he's like, Jesus, I don't want to just be partially clean, I want to be really clean because I think you're trying to teach us a deep spiritual lesson with water and cleanliness and being clean. That's what, yes, I understand what you've done for us. Nope, not the lesson. Jesus, like you're way overthinking this. Verse 13, Jesus explains to him what he has done. You call me teacher and Lord. Two titles that rightly belong to me. Rightly but so. For that is what I am. And you're like, okay, I get it now. That's, that's the lesson. Your teacher and you're the Lord. And because you're teacher and Lord, you make us clean. And no, 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 no. That's not, that's not the lesson. Just keep listening, Peter. You call me teacher and Lord. That's what I am. Now that I, your Lord and your teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. And that's the lesson. Now that I, master and teacher, have washed your feet. If your job as student is to learn from the teacher, this is the lesson. You've seen the teacher washing your feet. Now you, the student, go wash other people's feet. If I, the master, have humbled myself to wash your feet, 
then you wash others' feet. Verse 16, I tru- very truly, I tell you, no servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. In other words, I'm the master, you're the servant, and so the way you can serve me, because you're not greater than me. And so if I, the master, am willing to humble myself, you, the servant, ought to really be able to at least humble yourself as much, probably more, though. If I am, if you're the messenger, and I'm the one sending you, then the way that you send the message is to get down and serve, wash other people's feet by an example, by the, following the example I've set you. And look what he says, verse 17. Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. And no. What he was trying to teach them in that moment was not a lesson about cleanliness and being cleaned, being washed, water, some kind of deeper spiritual message. It was a very simple message taught by his example. We humble ourselves and we serve. Even the people that we lead, we lead by humbling ourselves and serving. No job is too small, no task is too menial, No leader or master or teacher or parent or father or CEO or king or governor is too great, high, and mighty. No position is too great to not put on a towel and to do the lowest, menial, humbling tasks. And you will be blessed if you do them. And he says, I have given you an example that you should follow my example. And what Jesus teaches us here and gives us here is the power of example. Do what I do. And what I do is serving. And so if you're going to do what I do, and since what I do is serving, then what you should be doing is serving. Jesus sets an example. He also gives us a really great leadership lesson of setting examples. By the way, did you notice that even though he knew that Judas was going to betray him, he still washes Judas' feet. It doesn't say that he skipped over Judas. And he washes the feet, even the one who would betray him. Here's what we're talking about today. Seeing the example of Jesus who sets the example, who then says, if you do what I do, then you're going to continue to follow my example. And by following my example, I mean, these are the future leaders of the Jesus movement that he is starting. And he says, by following my example, you're going to set an example for the people who follow you, hopefully that they will be servants as well. And as servants who rise up to be leaders, they will set an example for others. And as we lead, we continue to set examples. And Father's Day, one of the best messages that we can be reminded of fellow dads dads is that we dads, we are constant example setters. And we could go around the room and we could tell some stories of times when we have seen our kids follow our example. And sometimes it's funny. Sometimes it's not so funny. Sometimes when we see our kids acting just like us, we're like, oh no. Next week, Drew's going to have you text in those stories. Okay, maybe not. Dads, We are constant example setters, and the reality is whether we want to be or not. By nature of our position as dad, by nature of our position as husband, by nature of our position as a man, we are constant example setters, and people are watching, taking their cues from us. I read the story this week of Tim Dalrymple. At one time when he was in college, he was the NCAA's top male gymnast. He loved it. He was good at it until in an event he broke his neck. And after breaking his neck and lying flat on his bed in a hospital and recovery center, wondering what recovery was going to look like, at that point, with a lot of time on his hands, all of the questions that he had always been asking of himself and of the universe, and if there was a God out there, all of those questions came back. He says that he was naturally kind of a philosophically philosophically minded, and he'd asked a lot of questions naturally, and he wondered if there was a God, if there was a purpose, and just try to sort through the big questions of life and of the universe. And in that moment, lying flat on his back trying to recover, he said he could not get away from the example of his dad. His dad, who was a spiritual leader, his dad, who was a great example, but his dad, who was a righteous man 
who is a kind and loving and gentle man, but a righteous man as well. And he had lots of questions, but he couldn't get away from the example of his dad. And he knew that his dad had something in his life, had something in his heart that was undeniable. And that moment, lying on his back in recovery, was a turnaround point for him in which he realized that his biggest questions were answered by the way his dad lived his life that was undeniable. He turns his life over to Jesus. It leads his way to go on to earn a PhD in Harvard and now serves as editor of a large online media and blogging community that helps people wrestle through the biggest questions of their faith and explore their faith. Dads, we are constant example setters. But here's where the conversation can go a little sideways. We hear messages like this a lot. Men, we need to be men of strength, godly strength. We need to be men of truth and godly truth. For we are examples and people are watching. We are leaders and we need to be leaders. And those are all true. But I I think, but I think if we're honest, we would say that a lot of times we hear messages and encouragement and teaching like that. We feel the, the pressure that comes along with that. And we feel the pressure of being told that we need to be men of strength and truth and and the high pressure that comes with that. And right when we begin to feel the pressure of that leadership and you need to lead by example and be men of truth is that is when the voice of shame speaks up. That's when the voice of shame catches our ear and we begin to buy into those old messages. At least we begin to hear those old messages. We begin to fight those old messages and we say, you know what, I'm no leader I know I'm supposed to be a man of truth, but man, I feel like a failure. I've compromised the truth too many times. How can I be some leader? I'm supposed to be a man of strength, but I know that I've given in too many times. I feel so weak. That's the the message of shame that shame has been telling me. I'm no leader. I'm not sure my wife respects me. I'm not sure my kids respect me. And all those other people up there, up on the stage, they must have it all together, but I know that I don't have it all together, and I am battling these messages of shame, and I'm pretty much convinced that they are true, that I feel like a failure. I feel like I'm weak, and so I don't know that I can ever be that leader that all these Christian men say that I'm supposed to be. I think we're honest in moments of honesty, sitting around a campfire where we can't quite see each other's eyes. We, 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 We fess up. Yeah, that's often how we feel. And if you've ever felt like this, if you've ever battled these messages of shame, congratulations, you're normal. John Eldridge is a, um, he's a counselor and he loves Jesus. And for years now, he has helped men especially figure out and think through and pray through and find healing from some of these, um, these, these, these messages of shame that we hear and that we buy into. He's had this amazing ministry with men. He's off, authored several books. And in, in the first one of his books that he read, he talked about, he talked about the arrows. And when he, and I read this section of the book, it really resonated with me. He talked about the arrows in our hearts. And he says, every guy can remember, and pr- probably every woman as well, but he especially writes to men, okay? He says, all of us guys, we can remember those moments, those occasions in our childhood, in our teenage years, when the messages of shame began to attack us, and they were like arrows to our hearts. Moments when somebody made fun of our big ears, Moments when somebody disappointed us and that disappointment went deep and it rocked our lives. Moments when we got beat up by a bunch of kids at school who called us weak and ugly and whatever other name came along with that. And those moments were like arrows to our hearts and we internalized those messages. We believed them and we began to accept the lies of shame, believing things like I'm bad, I'm ugly, I'm unloved, I'm alone. No one's looking out for me. What's the arrow in your own heart and life? I hope you've got some guys around you with whom you can be honest and talk about the arrows that have pierced your heart. They often happen when we're young. And so then we grow up, usually not healed. In his next book, John Eldridge refined his thoughts a little bit, and he said that usually those arrows 
come from our fathers. Mm. Yeah, we're getting real today. The wound, the messages of shame often come from our fathers. And as I thought through it, I realized, yeah, because as little boys, we, we look up to our fathers. And as we look up to father and dad, we put really high expectations on him, right? Because he's dad, and he's big, and he's strong, and he leads, and I want to be like him. And, and dad, well, he's dealing with his own stuff, right? And we put him up on this pedestal that he should never be up on, and he almost can't help but to let us down because he's imperfect as well, and he's dealing probably with his own arrows of shame and that, he, that, are, that are maybe not healed in his own life, and so he's going to let us down. Or, or maybe you just never had the father or male figure to look up to, and he was absent. And maybe you needed your dad and you didn't get it, whether he died when you were young, or he worked too much and was never around, or he was just completely distracted with his own stuff and he was absent. And we're boys. We're too young to deal with the pain of sin and try to understand it. So what do we do? We internalize it. We accept it. As kids, we know that, that, that we still we have, this, we have egocentrism, right? That as kids and adolescents, we believe that we're basically the center of the world and everything revolves around us, or it should. And so when something bad happens to us, we internalize it as if we caused it. It's our fault. And if we weren't bad, alone, ugly, whatever it may be, we wouldn't have caused it. It must be my fault. And so we begin to believe the lies of shame that say, I'm weak, I'm alone, I'm not worthy of love, I can't count on anyone. I don't like to share these out loud all the time, but I remember my wound. The arrow came very clearly. One day, I think I was in fifth grade, walking home from elementary school, and the community center was right next to our school. And so we cut through the community center, walked through the community center area where all the game tables were, and there on the bulletin board was the flyer for this year's traveling baseball team, in which you could play not only in Little League and play the other teams in the city, but you could be on the traveling team and go distances and play other teams. And I loved playing baseball. I was finally old enough to try out for the traveling team. And I went home and said, guess what? The flyer was out. Time to sign up for the traveling team. And my dad said, you really think you can make the team? He was probably thinking to himself, I don't want to drive him all over town for practices and games. But you know what I heard? What I heard was, you're not good enough to make the team. You're weak and incompetent. I don't think that's what he intended to say, but that's what I heard. I'm a kid. The world revolves around me. It's all about me. And that's what I heard. It was one of the arrows. Of course, I remember hearing his own story, one of the arrows for my own dad was when he was junior or senior in high school and he was applying to college, he wanted to be an engineer. And he had the application all filled out and he brought it down and just needed my grandfather to sign it and to write the, applica- the check for the application. And his dad said, do you really think you're college material? And he never turned in the application. My dad was carrying his own wounds. It scares me to think Have I already had the conversation when Easton's come down the stairs with an idea, something, and I responded in an unhealthy way, and he's carrying an arrow? Probably. So I'm stuck in this multi-generational pattern of wounded men who wound each other. How am I an example to be followed? I think when we men hear messages like this, be an example, be a leader, be, we say, I don't think I can. So at that point, John Eldridge again speaks up, and there's a new insight that I really kind of gained from him in rereading some of his material this week. And he said, that, so then we guys, we're, we're walking around with these unhealed wounds. <clears throat> and so we tend to either overcompensate and we get loud and violent or we shrink back. By the way, 
His best book is the book Wild at Heart. If some of this is resonating with you, guys, and you've never read it, we've got a couple of copies available. I put a few more back at the Connection Center. If you will read it, um, you can have a free copy. It is, is remarkably, has been, it's changed my life, and just some of the insights are so, so helpful. Pick up a copy today. You can stop by while you're getting your beef jerky from the embarrassing story that your kids sent in, and uh, grab a copy, if you will, as well. So he says that men will either overcompensate and get loud and violent or will shrink back and become passive. Let's go back to the story. So Jesus has just washed his disciples' feet. Now look at verse 19. He says, I I mean, he says, I've set an example for you to follow. Then he talks a little bit more. Look what he says now, verse 19. I'm telling you now before it happens so that when it does happen, you will believe that I am who I am. Skip down to verse 21, and after he said this, Jesus was troubled in spirit. They can see the anguish on his face, and he testified, very truly, I tell you, one of you is going to betray me. Ouch. They're wondering who it is. Who's going to betray you? Who's going to betray you? And Jesus takes a piece of bread, he dips it in the sauce, and he gives it to Judas. As Judas is eating it, he says, go and do what you must do. Go and do what you've had planned. The text says that Satan entered him. In that moment, he runs out of the house. He goes, finds the Jewish leaders, and he says, I know where to find Jesus tonight. Let's get this over. In just a few short hours, he's going to lead the the temple guard to Jesus where he'll be arrested and will start the process of trial leading to crucifixion. And Judas is the one who betrays him and hands him over. Jesus goes on. My children, verse 33, I will be with you just a little while longer. You will look for me, and just as I told you, told the Jews, so I tell you now, where I am going, you cannot come along. So as I'm going away, you can't come along with me. Now, if you know the story of Jesus and his followers, who do you think speaks up? The one who always speaks up when there's an awkward situation, Peter. And look what Peter says, verse 36. Simon Peter answered him, Lord, where are you going? And Jesus replied, where I'm going, you cannot follow now, you'll follow later. And Peter answered, because Jesus given him an answer was never enough to say, okay, I don't really understand, but okay. No, he always talks back and in verse 37, Peter asked, Lord, why can't I follow you? I will lay down my life for you. And Jesus answered, will you really lay down your life for me? Very truly, I tell you, before the rooster crows tomorrow morning, you will deny me, you will disown me three times. Now, remember what we said earlier? We're carrying these wounds, and here's what we men will do. We'll either, to two responses to the shame that we carry, the arrows that are unhealed in our hearts, we will, we will shrink back and become quiet and passive, which usually turns into passive-aggressive, or we'll be loud, violent, and aggressive. And here we have an example of two men, each carrying their own wounds. Judas, looks like he takes the passive, shrink back, passive-aggressive route. He goes out and betrays Jesus. Peter takes the in-your-face, aggressive, loud, overcompensating, making big, brash promises of what he will do. We see it in these two men. What do you think were the messages of shame that Judas and Peter were carrying? I mean, you can imagine the messages of shame that Peter had heard his whole life. Peter, why do you have to talk so much? Peter, why do you have to make big, bold promises? Peter, why do you have to ask so many questions? Peter, why do you, Peter, if you'd just be quiet once in a while, Peter, if you would just, and I imagine Peter's, I mean, he's just, I mean, he's carrying a whole quiver full of arrows in his heart, always, because he just says things at the wrong time, says dumb things, big, brash, loud, ah, and people are just, I bet Peter's got a lot of wounds. Maybe you do too. And so again, we show up for Father's Day and we hear the usual message. Be strong, be men of integrity, be men of faith, be men of honor. And we say, yes, 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 and yes, I want to. That's who I want to be. But how can I be that when I'm battling these voices of shame and I just feel so weak and beat up? And I know they're not true, but man, it sounds as if they're true and my track record is not too great.
in the need, in the solution, and the grace is right here in the story. Is that every one of us needs healing from the wounds. Healing from the wounds that to help us reject the lie of shame. That every time that voice speaks up and we begin to hear it, you're alone, you can't count on anybody, it's all up to you, we say no. I'm not alone. I've got a God who walks beside me, Holy Spirit of God who lives inside me, and I've got some guys that I can call when I need some help. I'm not alone. How do I battle? How do I find healing and battle the wounds of shame? I believe it begins with this. I begins with asking the question, so how does God Almighty see me? Because the essential message of shame to really get us down is to say, God doesn't like you, God thinks you're a screw-up, and God has discarded you. But look at how the Son of God pursues Peter. And I think one of the reasons we love Peter is because he's a lot like us and he gets himself in trouble, but then... Unlike Judas, who after he betrays Jesus goes and he takes his own life and he rejects and he just throws everything away and he doesn't even give Jesus a chance to pursue him, Peter, he still sticks around and Jesus pursues him. Jesus comes after him. Maybe you read the story and if you've never read it before, this would be a really great Father's Day story to read in John chapter 21 when Jesus, probably a couple weeks after the, after the resurrection, he comes after and he finds Peter and he gets Peter off to the side and he says, Peter, listen to me, Peter, Peter. Do you love me? And Peter's like, oh, man. The data says no. My track record says no. But Jesus, I love you. And Jesus says, I got a job for you. I know you love me. Feed my sheep. And three times he wants to make sure Peter hears it. He says, I've got a job for you. I still believe in you. Okay, okay, wait, let me, let me, say, let me restate that. I, God is going to work and continue to do his work in you, and so we believe in what God is going to do in you and through you. You don't even believe in yourself. You're struggling to believe that God still has a purpose and a plan for you, but Peter, God has great plans for you. And he gives Peter a mission. Peter, the very guy who, just like us, could shrink away or attack others, walking around with these unhealed wounds in his heart. And he says, Peter, come here. And I believe he embraces him. He says, Peter, you love me? Now keep serving me. I washed your feet. And and so, man, I, I just, honestly, I'm not quite sure how to end this today. And I've struggled with this last little part. So how about we just do this? Can I leave you with an image that I want you to take with you? In the moment that Peter thought he needed his whole body to be washed, Jesus said, shh, 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 just let me wash your feet. Peter could look back in that moment and say, Jesus knew that I was going to disown him, and he washed my feet. Jesus humbled himself because he loved me enough to serve me. But Jesus, I denied I even knew you, and you washed my feet. And Jesus said, yep, I washed your feet. You were not rejected, Peter. Peter, you were worth giving my life for. Guys, you feel like you're not a leader worth following, you're not an example worth following, and the messages of shame are getting the best of you, maybe you just stop in this moment, and every moment you begin to hear the messages of shame come back, and you stop, and you put yourself at that dinner table, and there's Jesus, and he takes off your shoes, and he takes off your socks, and you don't really like people touching your feet. It's kind of weird. How could ever, anybody ever get a pedicure? I'm with you. <laughs> and Jesus, he says, you're not alone. You're not rejected. I love you. And he washes your feet. And he says, listen to how I speak to you, and I'll counteract the voice of shame. And watch the example for how I treat you, and it'll counteract the messages of shame. And know that I, the Son of God, I love you. I gave my life for you. I accept you. You are not rejected. You are not alone. What would it be like for you and I 
to live with that powerful image every time the messages of shame want to get the best of us. Jesus, I pray that you would find every person in this room, every person who's watching online today, you know the messages of shame that get the best of us, that get us down, that get us discouraged and defeated, that get us in a rage or get us isolated. God, I pray, would you counteract those messages of shame with your truth today? And for everyone in the house, man or woman, Jesus, I pray, would you speak up today? Would you speak the truth to our hearts that we so need to hear? And that we would know you as the God, the Lord, the teacher, and the Savior who washes our feet. that we're never alone, that we are not rejected, that we are not unloved. God, I pray for dads today, would you build them up and encourage them, strengthen them, And as they lead their families and lead their kids and lead the people around them, oh, God, I pray, would you give us the courage to trust you and follow you? That the people who follow us would be more like you because of how we live our lives. And we will give you the glory and the credit, Jesus. Lead us. In your name we pray, we cast ourselves on you today. Amen.